All good? Excellent. Good morning. How are we doing? Everybody ready for lunch? Well, right before that, your penance before you get to lunch is you got to listen to me talk about how you can actually do remote code execution in your environment. Everybody ready for that? Great. All right. So, a few months ago, you may have heard about a situation where various Apache servers of different versions had a vulnerability in the Log4j service. Everybody knows about that? Or anybody heard about that? Okay, great. See, a lot of, even had a hand raised in the back. Great. How do you know what's running in your environment completely? Everybody know every server, every service that's running in their environment? Raise your hand if you know all of them. Every one of them? Every version? Okay. So, now that we've introduced the situation, let's talk a little bit about what this actually means for your environment. The Apache Log4j vulnerability. This is a timeline that is fairly well known. Public information as far as what has been available. Initially, the vulnerability was reported to Apache November 24th, 2021. From there, the remote code execution vulnerability was provided and identified in the wild. It was running. People were actually exploiting it. From there, NIST provided a understanding of the CVE with releases and updates, depending on what version of, of Apache you were running. And I'll talk to the mic better. And then, of course, widespread scanning, coin miners, and all the wonderful people out there began to utilize it. How? How do they utilize it? What does this mean? Injecting into the logging service, they were able to put code into the different ways to hit those different servers. And using those co that codes, they were able to exploit the vulnerability to get information out, including login credentials. Everybody get that? Does anybody see a problem with that? Raise your hand if you do not see a problem with that. You don't see a problem? You're, okay, here you go. All right. This is a capability that we provide called attack service management using something called Expanse. You need to know not just what you know about, but you need to know what you don't know about. What's running in your environment? What servers are running what versions of Apache that may have that vulnerability associated with that? Is that a good thing? I would say it would be. Not only what servers do you know about that you've already patched, but what servers don't you know about that may still be vulnerable. Here, we saw, see a, a capability for providing automation. This is an example of a playbook that we provide using our XSOAR technology, our SOAR technology. SOAR stands for Security, Orchestration, Automation, and Remediation. Notice the last word. Remediation. Fix it. Not just discover it. Not just discover it automatically. Not just automate the, all the different interactions, but fixing it. All right. Now for the canned demo. That is a PowerPoint. Are we ready? <laughs> okay. All right. This is the, the dashboard. It gives us an insight into the XOR platform and how an analyst would actually look at different scenarios in our, in our environment. Automation can be provided to take care of different levels of manual processes. And I can't concentrate while he's taking a picture of me. But if you have repetitive tasks that need to be performed in a SOC, this would eliminate the necessity for those tasks and free up your different personnel to provide those tasks to be performed more quickly. Letting technology talk to technology in an automated fashion, and where necessary, let people talk to people 
to get greater levels of fidelity of where need, things need to be addressed. Speed and scale is what we're talking about. And when, ta- when you're looking at these different vulnerabilities, being able to assess what's in your environment and being able to automatically remediate them as rapidly as you possibly can with oversight from human beings where necessary is going to be critical to providing the security that your organizations require. This is a drill down into the different incidents. And my finger stopped. There we go. This is a drill down. Now we're looking at incidents that are in this environment. Specifically, we're going to look at the one called the expanse issue. In here, we see a breakdown of the actual incident itself. We get more information regarding what is running in our environment. I'm going to go back a few slides. Up, oh, I'm going forward. Remember I talked about this one earlier? The attack service management gave us the ability to see what servers are running in our environment and therefore understand, based on how they responded to various things, whether or not they have their vulnerable Apache versions. Once we know that, we can determine, based on what we see in your environment, if you do indeed have those vulnerable systems. Feeding our SIM, in this case, in our example, we're using... Um, a SIM that provides overall visibility to our organization, that SIM got a hit. What does that mean to you? When that SIM got a hit from the attack service management saying, boom, we have a vulnerable system, at least one. I don't know if you guys can see it, but up here, I have the, remote, the capability of determining exactly what's running in my environment for the infrastructure. And one of the log4j's that I found in here, I found the log4j, it's not on this slide, sorry. I found 10 servers that had that vulnerability running. Is that a problem for my organization? Could it be a problem for my organization? What could I do about it? We saw earlier the remote code execution and the necessity of actually a remote person being able to address the different servers and that vulnerability and injecting code. Could I block that with my firewall? Possibly. Depending on the sophistication of the firewall. Could I block it automatically on perhaps the agent running on the server? Possibly. Could I just take that server offline? Possibly. How do I want to remediate it is based on my security posture and my policies for my organization. This allows you to customize your environment based on the log4j or other vulnerabilities you may have in your environment. Playbooks, you can automate that. Again, customize, change, adapt. Our incidents. Here's how we're running this environment and how we're running this incident. Does this look complex? It's easy. It's drag and drop. Start off small. Something like this. Finding out what you're running in your environment. Seeing if it's it's applicable to you. Testing it and determining if the, that vulnerability is remediated using the steps that you're taking in here. Once you've ran that, you can run through the... Notice how we have red, error running playbook. Anybody see that? What does that mean? That means there was something about the playbook that did not complete. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It doesn't mean that we actually broke something. Maybe it does. Maybe... There's some step that a human being had to take in order to complete the next step of that particular playbook. Do we want people to do things? Sometimes. Do they make mistakes? Sometimes. 
here's some of the attributes of the particular issue that we're relating to it. We would be able to use this as evidence for how we handle this particular incident. Log4j has specific indicators of compromise that we would need to know. We'd also need to know if somebody is actually performing this remote code execution, what are they doing, where are they coming from, how do we know that? We can see that from logs coming from our firewall. We can see that from logs coming from the actual servers that are running. We can see that from the other um, parts of our, our organization. Has anybody ever seen a firewall log and, and, and read it to, to the, its completion? Probably not. But you can actually get through that information a lot of from what you would actually need to stop in your environment. Do you know if those IP addresses involved or those different sites that are involved are actually malicious or not? Somebody might know. How would we know? Well, threat intelligence feeds would provide us the information necessary to determine if that IP address or that pair of IP addresses are the issue or going to be an issue for us. Certain organizations provide us that information. When they provide us that information, we could have that repository accessible and automatically determine if those individuals involved are a problem or not. Automatically. Here we have a collaboration capability built into the actual interface. You and other parts of your organization could communicate with each other as well as threat feeds could actually provide you greater detail of information so you can then determine if this is an incident for you or not. Has Log4j been remediated completely? Have we done this? Have we ever seen this before? This is where we can actually understand if we this ran in our environment before or if we had this other incident ever seen and if so, what happened? Automatically being able to tie various incidents together, we can now look at how our organization is running more efficiently. We can see if we've actually changed the posture of our security and how much more rapidly we've handled these environments and we've actually handled this particular incident. Questions? I know you guys just want to go to lunch. You're free when, when you guys stop asking questions. So, no more hands, please. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Cool. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Santisaban, and I'm glad to have a big crowd in front of me here. Uh, representing uh, Aries Security, and uh, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes learning about a, uh, a training system that we call Capture the Packet. Um, so hopefully we'll get some good information out of it. Please, if you have any questions as I go along, please stop me and ask your questions. And uh, this button's not working. There you go. Um, first of all, regarding the capture the packet, uh, one of the things that's unique about this product is that it wasn't originally intended to be a training platform. Uh, our origin actually starts with, De is everybody familiar with DEF CON, or the hacker conference? We've been, we've been uh, running a hacker village at DEF CON for almost 25 years now. And about six years ago, I think it was, uh, a gentleman from DOD came down there looking for a hacker competition, a black badge event that could be turned into a training platform. Um, very forward thinking. Anyway, we competed for an opportunity to actually provide the product to DOD, and we won that contract. And from that contract came Capture the Packet, as we now see it. So, it's, again, we took a hacker competition, turned it into a DOD training platform under DOD contract. So, go figure. Anyway, since then, we've had, We've had the opportunity to do a number of different uh, uh, solutions for DOD, so we both have a, a defensive cyber training platform, which is what we call Capture the Packet, <clears throat> and then we've since developed an offensive training platform based upon the same platform here. Uh, one of the things that's really unique about our product as well is the fact that we've actually been involved with uh, the Army, with PCTE, so actually our product's been used for a number of the pilot projects for PCTE and continues to be uh, considered 
as a prime source for PCT as a content provider. Uh, the product itself, it's, what's intriguing about it is the fact that originally as it was designed, as you see up in the upper right hand corner, it, it was in a big case and it continues to be provided as a big case. The uh, reason why that's, that was thought to be unique and valuable is because of the fact that it could be, it's a standalone product that does not require the internet. So consequently, the DOD loves it because they could put it in classified environments where they could do their training as needed on ships as training as needed without the need for the internet. So very secure uh, application. The application now also is provided as a software as a service as well. But, uh, but again, both products are unique. In fact, something that we just came up with was uh, actually having the standalone system in a backpack for special forces where they can actually go out in the field and have a eight concurrent uh, trainees on the system at one time using a backpack uh, environment. Anyway, regarding the system itself, the training actually is a hands-on environment. So it's not just rote learning. It's actual functional learning through the use of uh, solutions or challenges that are provided to each participant. So they have a challenge, they use tools, in fact, tools that they use every day to solve those challenges. Now, what's unique about this is, remember, the origin of this thing was a black badge event. So it is a gamified learning environment. So as these students compete, I mean, as they learn, they compete against each other. There's a scoreboard up. So again, they, they see those challenges, they see the points that they're getting, and obviously it's a reinforcement for a lot of them, although we've learned over time that these kids don't need reinforcement. They get into the system and they just don't want to quit. They want to keep learning. Um, again, aim, game of learning, and I apologize for having to turn my back because I've got to read this thing from behind me here. Um, the, thing, the other thing that's unique about this product, too, is that it's not just a training system. It's also an assessment system, and that's the key uh, element for a lot of folks right now. They need to be able to assess these kids before they come in, either into the military or basically shifting from one job in the military to cyber. This is a great tool for assessing what those skills are before they get into it, and then, again, developing those skills over time. But it's also for individuals and teams. So it's both a team environment and also for, a, a, excuse me, individuals and teams to do the training. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on here. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's, the Internet's not required for that standalone system. So that's, a, again, a valuable option. Hands-on by learning, solving challenges, using tools. So now the other thing that's unique about this product it is, it is what we call tool agnostic. So now a lot of systems actually require you to use specific tools. We don't require anything. So basically you can use tools that you use every day to do this training. So that's a valuable insight here because of the fact that now these kids can actually learn using what they do every day. And then as, as we try and say, they, 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 learn how, <clears throat> they learn how they fight. So they actually use the tools that you, they use daily. Uh, gamified learning, as I mentioned before, they earn points. This is a really unique feature. It's called an anti-collusion feature. Now, basically the way it works, let's say if you were running a competition, you had 25 participants. You as the administrator, and I'll show you a little bit more about how this all happens, you basically set up the, the game. So you select uh, challenges, you basically get them all ready, Students are ready, and then you start the game. Now, what's going to happen is all 25 of them are going to get the same challenges. And then, so let's say they all pick the 50-point challenge for file forensics. They all open it up at the same time. What's going to happen is every single one of them are going to have a different question. It's going to be the same question, but with a different little bite to it. So let's, for example, they're looking for a, a password. So they'll say, uh, what's the password for Joe? The next guy's going to have, what's the password for Phil? On and on and on. So all 25 of them are going to get something different. So what's good about that? What's good about that is two things. One is the fact that they can't cheat because the answer that I get is going to be different from the answer that you get, even if you're sitting right next to me. So, and I've seen this time and again, and this is the craziest thing I've ever seen in a competition, but we've seen 25 people, they're all competing against each other. All of a sudden you see one guy stand up and go over to another person to help them. Now, is that, is that wrong? For that person to help them? No. It is wrong if they gave them the answer and all they did was the answer in. But all they can do is basically say, listen, I got the right answer. This is how I did it. And then that bas they basically now are teaching someone else how to get that answer. So that's a valuable, valuable uh, opportunity there of learning. So you got someone teaching someone else how to do it. And again, you eliminate that cheating capability. 
But the other important part is, too, is that let's say that the best way to learn is by re repetition, right? So let's say you're new at this whole thing, you're new at file forensics, you, you basically are now taking this training on your own. You take the same question over and over again. Every single time that you get it, you're going to get a different question. Even though it's the same level, it's the basic level, you're going to get the same thing. So again, it really, really helps in that rote learning process to be able to just do the same lessons over and over. And as you, get, as you progress and get better at it, then you just go to the next level. There's five different skill levels. So again, you can step up on your own, going from level to level. Okay. Uh, knowledge base. The other thing, too, that's really uh, important about this product is that it's developed for self-learning. You don't need an instructor in front of you. You could take the most basic person, and let's say they just don't understand anything about you know, searching the, the, the Internet, uh, doing analysis, packet analysis. They can go into the knowledge base, and literally it will walk them through the whole process of being able to do uh, packet analysis, doing this, doing that. Uh, by the way, I'm not technical. I'm a business development guy, so I'm going to talk to you guys like you're just ordinary people that don't know all this technology, because I don't. But anyway, needless to say, it's, it's very, very user-friendly. And again, it helps the individual be able to self-learn at, at a good level. Uh, the system actually has its own traffic generator, which is important because, again, what we've learned from DOD is the fact that there's traffic generators that are out there, but they're very repetitive. This thing here is just, continues to generate new traffic, so it really makes it challenging. And you can actually crank up the difficulty of, or the amount of information that's going through there. Again, depending on the level of the expertise of the people that are training. And I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, C, uh, cyber PT card. And then again, as I mentioned, uh, something that we have five different um, difficulty levels. Uh, relative to the skills, you can see over on the right-hand corner, there's 17 categories. There's over 100 different skills that we can work on. Those are the 17 categories that, that we can work through. And, and then again, this is just a sample of some of the skills themselves. You see two, uh, three-letter words up there. One is JQR and one is NIST. Uh, are, is everybody familiar with the NIST framework? You guys have fewer you. So basically, the NIST framework uh, put together by DOD, not by DOD, I'm sorry, by the, the federal government, is, is a real smart idea. Basically, they took cyber security jobs, and then they went at, went at it and said, okay, to perform this job well, what do you need to be able to do? What tasks do you need to be able to perform? And they created a list of tasks. And then within those tasks, they said, okay, what skills do you need to do to be able to do those tasks? And then just broke it down that way. And then basically say, okay, so this is how you, need, how you train someone to do this job. Learning these skills, doing these tasks, and doing this job. We took that same framework and incorporated it into our product. So that now if you have a file forensic analyst, you, as a supervisor, all you have to do is simply say, okay, fine, this is what you need to train on. And they go in there, and then basically now they could just go step by step, skill by skill, task by task, to be able to train. So they train exactly for the job that they're doing, which is, again, unique. Because a lot of times kids are training, and they're doing something out here that has nothing to do with what they have to do. The other thing is JQR. That's something we just incorporated. We're actually working with the Army right now to incorporate JQR into our product. So basically, JQR... In fact, I've got a slide. It's just, JQR basically are, is a checklist of things that kids have to be able to do to be able to do their job. And this is the, the, the military actually specifying what are the things that you need to do. We are incorporating that into our product as well. So again, you as a military supervisor can actually tell somebody you need to do these things. And go through the product and actually get through these things and be able to show me that you passed all this. And again, I'll be talking a little bit more about how exactly you show somebody that you accomplished what you were supposed to do. All right, and again, I talked about the cyber, uh, the NICE framework. The other thing that we're doing now, too, is we incorporate CPEs into this. So again, CPEs are basically certificates to say, hey, I finished something, and you get a certain amount of points. Why is that valuable? One, kids like to get stuff. They like to put stuff on their wall. This is a certificate basically saying they accomplished something. So that's number one. So is at the end of the year, they go to their boss and say, hey, listen, these are all the things that I did. Because, they, again, they have to have certain things that they have to be able to do before they can give them, make rank, before they can get raises or whatever it might be. Again, one way of being able to show that. Okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. Again, show some more challenges. Single sign-on is important. 
Also, too, another thing that's really important, too, is that we've included APIs, so um, you can actually tie this system into the learning management system. So now, because the DOD is continually maintaining training records, this can be actually tied into their training record, so that can be continually updated as well. Okay, makes sense? All right, and I talked a little bit, or it mentioned a little bit about reporting. This is another unique feature about this product that you don't see in that many products out there. And time and again, I've had people come to me and say, God, we have no way of managing or monitoring how, how people develop and, and or where they were at as a baseline and where they are now. Again, we have a very robust uh, reporting system, very graphic, as you can see. You've got a spider chart there that just shows the different skills, obviously where they're at at each particular skill level. A dial-up a, a monitor there, again, showing where they're at. It shows the different uh, skills, again, the strength within each skill. Again, very easy for you as a supervisor or a manager to be able to help people understand. <clears throat> this is where you're at. This is where you need to be. This is what you got to do. And they can do this on their own as well, so it doesn't require a supervisor to do it for them. Okay. Uh, another thing, too, is that, again, the system comes with all these challenges already pre-packed into it. But as you can imagine, in a world where everything changes every, every day and, and all the new challenges that we face from the outside, uh, we actually have the ability to provide custom challenges to, for our customers. So if they all of a sudden are seeing some challenges from a foreign adversary or from somewhere else, that they say, God, we really need to work on that particular challenge, but we have no way of doing it. If they can come to us, and we can actually create challenges that will help people train to be able to deal with the challenges that they face every day. So that's something that we do customize. Um, we have crowdsourcing. So those challenges that I just talked about, as each, as each organization or each customer um, hires us to do that, with their permission, we'll actually put it into a pool so that anybody who's using this thing within the military can actually use those same challenges. Um, again, classified and unclassified environments. And we, as I mentioned before, we do have a, a force-on-force module to, uh, to support this. That's my name up there, and there's going to be a little bit more time. You got it? Cool. All right. I was going to do a demo, but the uh, Internet here is so spotty that I, was, I didn't want to embarrass myself with the things shutting off. So what I did is I, I took some screenshots uh, to be able to show you the, the inner workings of the system. Now, there's a lot, of, a lot that goes into it for the individuals to be able to enter in their information so we know who each individual is that's, that's playing the game or operating. So what I'm going to show you, though, is that you, what you as an administrator would be doing to manage the process. So as I mentioned before, it's challenges that you provide to these individuals, and you decide what challenges you want to provide them before they compete. So one way of being able to select the challenges is by category. So again, you see all those categories I showed you before over here on the side. So again, if you're going to be, um, there you go, if you're going to be setting this up, uh, this challenge, what you do is you decide on a, on a particular category. Then within that category, you decide on subcategories. The difficulty level here, you see basic, you see advanced, intermediate, you see all the different levels. This is going to be all, all these are going to be using network traffic that's going to be generated by the system. Okay, and then here's the individual challenges themselves and what they are. Okay, so again, I mean, very, very challenging. I mean, again, a lot of variety there for these individuals. And again, this is functional learning people. This is not just BS where they're spitting back stuff. They have to show that they know what they're doing. And this is, this is how you provide uh, a challenge for them to be able to prove that they know what they're doing. Okay? So that's one by category. The other one is by skills. So here's individual skills. And again, same situation. Take a particular skill. Again, look at the categories. Here's memory for analysis, advanced. Now, here are downloads, so this is different. So instead of using um, network traffic, they're actually going to be downloading data, and then from that downloading data is where they're going, ahead. they're going to be presented with their challenges, and they go forward from there. Okay. Okay, now here's where we go into the, the, the NIST frameworks. Again, as I mentioned before, it goes by category. So here are all different types of jobs that that are, are available, that are out there, where there's analysis for it. And same thing, pick a particular job, and then it'll give you a, a list of all the different tasks within that job and the different uh, challenges that you can uh, uh, present to them. And then now, so here's one, and this by work role, 
And then this is this by KSAs. So KSAs are the knowledge, skills, and abilities statements. And then within those statements, they're all numbered. And then so all you do is pick the particular KSA you want. And again, same thing. All the challenges are all presented to you. And this is a, a picture of one of the uh, screenshots for the, from the game itself. So this is so you as an operator, this is what you would see. So when the game starts, boom, you go into this, and here you see the, the point levels. And then here you see, this is the question itself. And this is where they en would uh, enter their answer. Now here's something that's interesting is that we actually offer hints. So again, going back to this whole thing about the ability of people at different levels without an instructor being there, what happens when they get snapped? Oh, I really don't know what to do. You can go into the hints. Now, the interesting thing about hints is that we, we call them good hints or bad hints. You as the administrator can basically not penalize them for using a hint. It basically helps them to get started. But let's say after two or three times, you start penalizing them. Every time they go into the hints, they, they get knocked down a couple of points. Uh, so again, there's ability to be able to offer them that capability to use hints, but also too, there's an uh, ability to be able to penalize them for using hints, because obviously in life there's not too many hints. You got to do it or you don't do it, right? Now here's another thing that's really interesting, and uh, we call it a round manager. Now going back to that scenario at the beginning where we got 25 participants, so you're as a manager, you started the game, you got 25 players out there. You want to know what's going on. I mean, you want to know how these guys are doing or these gals are doing, and, and there's a way of doing it. Now, this is a unique in that you as, the, as a manager can actually click into any one of those individuals that's playing the game and actually see what questions they have, how many times they've, they've, they've provided answers, have they had wrong answers, how many times they've, they've attempted, how many wrong answers they have, how many right answers they have. All of a sudden, you, if all of a sudden you see green across there flat out, you say, oh, this is too basic for this particular individual. Whereas others, you may see, wait a second, this person has been sitting on the same question for the last two hours and can't get it right. What's going on? You might want to go over to that person and say, hey, it looks like you're having a challenge. And then you can help them out. So again, this is a very active way of being able to participate in the training environment, be able to help people as they're going on before they get into that frustration level. And, and, and if nothing else, just, just monitor what's going on. And then going back to that knowledge base as I was telling you about, again, a lot of resources here, uh, a lot of information, a lot of videos. I mean, how to use Wireshark, for example, to a lot of tools that are available to them. Uh, again, same thing with the screen, except up here, you'll see under applications, you'll see all these, these within all these categories are, are tools that are available to them. So this is nuts. And then here's the terminal that you'll open up to actually manage the network traffic, from there, you can actually pull a number of traffic, save it, and then go into Wireshark, do analysis, or whatever you might want to do. And then again, going back to those two uh, forms that we had before. And uh, that's it. Anyway, any, any questions from anybody? We're in booth 400, if you guys want to, to get some more questions. Also, too, uh, I invite any of you guys, if you really are interested in finding out more about this product and actually get a, a real technical professional uh, presentation uh, and, and demo, uh, please stop by the booth. We can actually schedule something like that for you and have our CTO uh, on the line. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a actually great product. And, and again, as I mentioned before, it's the only product I've ever seen where people get up and help each other, even though they're competing against each other. And also, too, the only product I've ever seen is we had one, we were running four concurrent sessions of two hours. At the end of the two hours, we physically had to pick people up out of their darn chairs and pull them out of the room because they would not leave. So this, people get addicted to this thing. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. Well, thanks everybody for making some time today. I'm uh, Kevin Cools with Forward Networks, and we're going to talk about you know the buzzword out there. A lot of people are talking about zero trust, right? How can we get there? How can we assure access to applications, but only that given access? There's a lot of great products out there that are going to help us get there. But then there's that question: How do I know when I'm there? How do I know each step along the way that I'm making progress? That's where, specifically on the network side, we leverage a digital twin, mathematical model. 
to get us to that step, to understand all those permutations of traffic through our environment so we can establish some level of confidence in this zero-trust solution. We all know networking is hard. We've been doing it a long time. That's nothing new. But there's always the second step of that equation of we also have to get past another hurdle of compliance, of accreditation, of change control. And getting through that has always been a challenge of really trust of, of the security team and the operations team of the engineering folks. So how can we help provide them tangible evidence of uh, application reachability and isolation and protection? That's where Zero Trust comes in. We're trying to say, well, here's a way where we can show the applications are only reachable to the right people at the right time from the right device. It's very optimistic, if you will. And there's no one solution to get us there. There's no, oh, I buy that uh, fancy zero, uh, application firewall or out there and get an overlay technology that's going to provide that policy enforcement. There's a lot of steps along the way. And in fact, it gets a lot uglier when you start looking at the weeds of how do we, how do we implement zero trust. So this is all of those different silos as per the ATAR consortium that's focusing on providing zero trust for a network, for our, for our, our government employees and, and through our different organizations. If we dig into that, you know, how are we establishing any progress? We can't just run out and, and focus on, well, we got problems today in front of us of, of trying to establish progress. We have deadlines this month, next month, the month after that, that are coming down from executive orders to provide some evidence of our progress. So how do we get there? What's missing from this solution? What's missing to help us make that progress? Well, we have, how is our network behaving? Do we understand, other than what's in our heads, how this network is forwarding traffic? And then on the other side, do we understand, from a security perspective, what traffic can go from place in the network A to place in the network B to have that flexibility to show segmentation, whether micro or macro. And at the lowest level, just can we understand what's on the network? You know, asset management, users who are connected to the network, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, at least with some theme, to understand who's on the network, what's there already, and so we can understand that identity and the, and the devices and data that are already there. So how can we take that leap? Well, we've done this a few times before, right? If our first responders, they don't open up good old Rand McNally when they're trying to track down where they need to be to, uh, to respond to an incident. No, they've got GPS that can tell them all the different ways they could possibly get from point to A to B. There's a digital twin of the Earth represented in that GPS map. And also for the Internet. We don't you know, uh, click our way through the internet anymore, right? We have web crawlers that index all of that data out there and present us with search optimization so we can find what we're looking for rapidly and not burn cycles. You put those two together from the perspective of your network. Now I can understand all the different permutations of traffic in my network, but also I have all this configuration and state indexed and readily accessible to give me two things, instant access to my data, but leveraging that same data, now I can define correctness. I can help establish compliance, create compliance rules based on my zero trust objectives. And zero trust is a new term for what we've had all along. We've called it segmentation. We've called it firewall rules. We've called it network protection. We've called it all these different flavors over the years, current version of, the, of that whole title. And through a digital twin, there's a couple of definitions I want to I focus on, right? When I define digital twin, it's a behaviorally accurate software copy of the thing. In this case, a network, right? It includes a couple of key components. There's the map, which is great, right? 
there's an understanding of what's there. That's the table stakes. That's getting us started, right? The key is being able to understand all of the potential traffic, to go through what-if scenarios within that environment. What if I change this ACL over here? What traffic is allowed? What is denied? You know, what if I were to add an or a different compliance rule? What impact will that have to application reachability and isolation as well? And to do this at scale, right? We're not talking about small networks. We're talking about massive networks, whether they're federal networks or commercial. Whether you're a big bank, whether you're a large federal agency, or if you're even a, a, a deployable uh, a, a group of folks within our military. You know, all of these come down to large, agile, flexible, but also brittle at the same time networks. So now we can look at that digital twin against that eye chart that ATAR pr pr provided us with. You can see highlighted, these are places where that digital twin can help us execute. The yellow ones are directly, the, the blue ones are indirect, right? And I'm not going to read through them individually. We're going to cover a couple of key ones right? and, and, and focus on those key assets. So we talk about the device and the endpoint side. Just simply knowing what is out there, right? So if we think about digital twin for the network, it's going to collect all the configuration in state. So that means I have ARP tables. I've got MAC address tables. If, if the network doesn't know about it, it's not there. Right? So it, from all of that information, if I aggregate that, I know absolutely every endpoint in my network. I could use that a couple different ways. I could use that as source for my ACAS gaming. I could use that as a, a group of hosts or, or an object with which to translate all of my or that those applications are reachable from those given hosts. A couple different angles to look with that. And also for, for, uh, for intelligent response, to know, okay, now if I know where all my hosts are, and if I understand my traffic permutations, I can know all the different possible blast radius of those. So if we dig into visibility, right, one key one to focus on here is that we're collecting configuration in state. It's all text. Right? So does it, it doesn't matter if it's one collection, or in this case, three of my underlay, black network, my gray network, and my high side, my classified. I can take those three snapshots and actually merge them together to provide the true digital twin, because that's the reality. The network is all of those pieces if I'm looking at a CSFC environment. It's not just what can I ping or, or what can I SSH to or what can I gather net flow from? It's entire network together. And then I can define rules around compliance. So for example, I never want the red side to be able to talk directly to a black or gray. Makes perfect sense. My zero trust boundary there is avoiding data leakage. Also looking at all that configuration and state and visibility, I can define compliance as well, how we have traditionally. Things like sticks, things like uh, routing table correctness. I want to assure that peer devices have the same routing table, right? If we think about the stigs themselves, their boundary condition is around the configuration only. There's a lot more data that we can take advantage of when we think about the, the routing table, be, be it IPv4 or v6 or multicast routing, that presents the reality of what that network is ready to forward. So we want to make sure that redundant devices are actually providing redundancy and there isn't a mistake there. Looking at the network side, specifically, there's a lot of places that we can address for with a digital twin. For example, if we're looking at like some of the specific items within the, the EO, AC4, I want to make sure that specific traffic patterns are available. So I can go through my checklist of, all right, I only want to allow my database to my back end or my, my user to my front end. 
I can create these rules that persist within my twin and will alert me when there's a configuration or a state that will provide a, tra a traffic pattern that, that defies those rules. In addition, I, I so now I'll have a way to create alerts and to take action upon and be and notified before there's a breach, notified before there's an incident. Likewise, we can make more generic requests of, well, if I'm coming from an access switch, that's most likely a user, talking through a data center switch, most likely an application behind there, is there any way to get from access switch to data center switch without going through a firewall? Those are types of rules that I can set that go well beyond anything you can comply with or, or a configuration compliance. This is about network function. Is it doing what it needs to do? So this is where, where I talked about, you know, we've got great partners that provide those L7 firewalls, those application firewalls, but it doesn't do us a lot of good if the traffic is actually diverting around them. Likewise, on the application side, how can we support those mandates of those different pillars? We talk about everybody starts with a spreadsheet kind of like this when they build the network. Who needs to talk to who? And then we deploy the network and it's thrown out the window, right? But if we understand all the different permutations of traffic, it can persist. We can be aware any day, any time, what places the network can talk to other places in the network on which protocols. We can see in this case, specifically through the view of the digital twin with four networks, I can see gray is where there's no route. You can't get there if you tried. Red is entirely blocked with a firewall. Uh, yellow means partial connectivity. So there's certain ports you can click on that and, and dig deeper to know what IPs are allowed, sources and destinations. So you can really keep a grasp on what does my micro and macro segmentation look like. That's a key requirement as we're moving on to whatever we want to call our security journey, now called Zero Trust. Likewise, from the perspective of that visibility pillar, there's a couple of the key ones we can look at around continuous monitoring and auditing. We can say, well, we're going to gather configuration and state for those devices, and we're going to look for compliance, not just, again, with the stigs, but functional compliance. We build a query, if you will, querying a network like a database, so you can get it, get in front of these issues before they, before they rear their ugly head. Yep. I've got a device with NTP out of sync. It's not a config. It's not, a, it's not going to be caught with the stigs. It's a functional requirement. I can resolve that by, by looking at my state of my network, of my network devices. I, I query that as I collect that information regularly. Likewise, maybe I have someone created a too permissive of a rule with an NACL. I can catch that as well. And then say, oh, I want to remediate that. Or I can see there are two disparate tenants that should never touch each other. Oh, I see routes being leaked and advertised across. These are all things that we all see or could see with our subject matter experts. Doing show commands, logging into devices. But realistically, they can't do it 24-7. Realistically, we need them to do more interesting architectural work. We need to leverage the tools in front of us to save them time. So we can make our tier one and tier two operators more valuable. Give them tools that's going to make them more powerful so they don't just kick tickets up to those tier three and tier four individuals. And if we're made aware of these issues, we can resolve them. We can have auto remediation. We can build rules within that to say, when I see, if X, then Y. Hundreds of these queries are built into the platform. So instead of having that annual painful check, turn that into a daily occurrence. Another one around that more specifically, if we're looking at vulnerabilities, it's not rocket science. We know what versions of code we have running on devices. Usually it's a data call. Say, okay, you know, a new vulnerability came out. We're going to hear from our security engineers. Oh, I need to know who's, who, who's got routers and switches and firewalls vulnerable to this particular CVE that just came out. On top of that, it's not just is it that version of code, 
That's data call number one. Data call number two, well, do they actually expose the vulnerability? Is the configuration knob enabled? All right, well, now the network engineer, security engineer has got to do another thing. Got to look into that vulnerability and, and see if, that, if that's turned on or not. And then the third thing, based on that mathematical model, we can present what are all the possible sources that can then reach that device to take advantage of that vulnerability. So three data calls that would take hours of your su subject matter experts. They're doing it regularly because these vulnerabilities come out all the time. All baked into the platform. All available by API or UI for the security operators so they don't need to bother those engineers and, and security engineers. They can just do it on their own and have that datable, data updated automatically along these regular collections. So it's about, again, rapid access to data, and definition of correctness through that data. And lastly, talking about task automation. Again, if we have information, we can create guardrails around that automation, right? We have definitions of correctness that gives us the flexibility to either predict an outcome or to fail fast, right? If we make a change and then all of a sudden our rules and compliance are, are out of compliance, like whether it's reachability, or isolation, we'll get that feedback. So we can quickly you know, remediate either within that change window or come back, look at our data, and, and, and resolve the next time with context. It's about change window correctness, but it's also about assuring that you don't wake up to a bunch of phone calls on Monday morning after a big change. And on top of that, about around that incident response, you know, last, last ticket here, is that I want to know Okay, I have this host that was compromised. If I understand every possible permutation of traffic, where could it go? Who is next? You ask your incident response team now, what do they do? Well, they, they cut the cord to that device and they cross their fingers they didn't get anywhere else. It's not, it's not realistic for them to, to know all of the places it could touch on all of the different protocols. So this is effectively looking for that one IP address. It'll tell you the port it's connected to, tell you its first top gateway, and then it'll also tell you tabularly all the different destinations, different hosts that that, that that individual host could reach on what ports and protocols. So if it is a mailworm or a, a, a SQL bug, we know exactly which ones to take a closer look at. So this is just scratching the surface. There's a lot of different use cases for Digital Twin for your network. I encourage you to come see more. I'm right over there. If you have any questions or comments or want to try to prove me wrong, please stop on by. I'd love to have a chance to speak with you. Any questions?